Sometimes you just gotta take a step back and think about what could have been, whether it be canceled projects, rejected pitches, or maybe something that simply became a very different kind of game as development went on. I'm still not over Silent Hills getting canceled, but at least we've gotten to see the project evolve into something very different, yet very familiar. And sometimes this exact thing will happen in the world of platformers. Croc is probably one of the biggest examples of this. What started off as a pitch to create a 3D Yoshi game transformed into a totally new IP. See, it all started a long time ago when Argonaut Games was getting all buddy-buddy with Nintendo. They created the Super FX chip, which was used in games like Star Fox to create 3D visuals, or in games like Yoshi's Island to achieve advanced 2D effects like sprite scaling and stretching. So, with a great relationship with Nintendo kicked off, Argonaut Games started on a pitch for Nintendo for a 3D Yoshi game that would even predate Mario 64. Saving you the details, basically Nintendo was like, no, and Argonaut can continue the project anyway, reworking it into an original property. And all of that led up to the release of Croc, Legend of the Gobos, a platformer for the PlayStation 1, though it also came out on Saturn and on PC as well, and while I'm sure the PC version is the best version, I'm gonna go with the version that most people would have played back then on PlayStation 1. That and I really can't stand the way 3D PC games from back then look now, like having a high resolution and frame rate paired with these chunky models and textures from the 90s? Man, it just looks weird. I don't know, it just looks like this gross amalgamation of technology from the 90s combined with the higher resolutions of the later 2000s. It just does not look good to me. I I'm sorry. I gotta go with that iconic jagged look from the PlayStation. Now that's what I'm all about. But uh, yeah, before we start, how about a little bit from Argonaut Games? They've actually made a lot of stuff I'm familiar with, including some PS2 platformers like iNinja and Malice. They even made that Buck Bumble game. I'm sure a lot of people remember that just for the song. The company started in the 80s making Commodore games, but they'd eventually go defunct in 2004 after releasing Malice, which would be their final game. But that'll be one for another day. Today, we're talking Croc. The game starts up with, uh, oh, a real-time cutscene. Interesting. Uh, most of these PS1 games all did pre-rendered stuff back then for the intros, but here they had the characters act out everything in real time. That's cool. So these little fuzzball dudes named the Gobbos find an orphan baby crocodile, and we get this really adorable sequence of King Gobbo raising Croc and teaching him how to run and how to fight. <laughs> We then watch Croc grow up, which happens in an instant. I'm guessing this is supposed to be taken as like a passage of time. Like, I don't think he's literally just boing becoming big like that, especially with like uh, King Gobbo's reaction. I think it's supposed to be like, oh wow, look how big you've gotten, but not like, oh my god, what happened? You know, I, I think that's what they're going for. And I, I like that, that's really cute. But then, the evil Baron Dante. That is like the coolest villain name ever. Baron Dante, oh my god. Uh, this big green guy comes and starts kidnapping all of the Gobbos. Uh, King Gobbo then quickly summons a bird thing, I don't know, to bring Croc far, far away where he can't be kidnapped. Now, very far from home, it's up to Croc to go back and rescue his adoptive family of Gobbo, stop Baron Dante, and bring peace back to the world. You know, it's a, that's a solid platformer plot, I'd say. You know, not too little information, not too much. Uh, super cute, though. Like, the character interaction in this game is absolutely freaking adorable. So, uh, big points so far for presentation, at the very least. We start in this small open area, and man, the first thing I notice about this game is just how how weird the controls are. It's like this this bizarre analog tank control hybrid. You don't just push the stick in the direction you want to go, unless it's forward. Uh, you gotta walk forward and then turn yourself by pressing left or right. Pressing back will have Croc uh, do some steps backward, all the while the camera is locked on your back. So yeah, like it sounds like tank controls, right? But the thing is, pressing left or right doesn't just rotate you like tank controls normally do, only if you tilt the stick ever so slightly slightly will that happen. Pushing it all the way down, that'll have Croc like kinda run in that way, like like almost like it's not tank controls. So what I think they did is that they made the camera always lock to your back, and aside from pushing backwards, the game does actually use traditional analog controls, so it is almost analog, except for like backwards anyway, because it just makes you step backwards instead of turning around. Um, but yeah, the camera is still locked to your back, so it just feels like tank controls, even though it's not 
exactly tank controls? Yeah, it's gotta be full analog, because during the boss fights, the characters move in the direction you push the stick, and since the camera isn't behind you in these fights, it feels like a normal game with no tank control suddenly. It's so strange getting used to this, but I did end up finding it a lot more reliable than just the typical kind of tank controls. I mean, I would much rather just move the camera independently from the character, which actually you can. You can just use the right stick to fully rotate the camera, so why did they lock the camera behind you so it feels like tank controls then? And I know earlier PS1 controllers did not have these sticks, but even then you could have just done what most other PS1 platformers at the time did and just mapped the camera to the shoulder buttons. It's a very questionable setup, and it does take some getting used to, but it's not impossible to adjust. I struggled with it a bit at first, but by the end of the first world, I was doing just fine with it. Now, jumping will actually take you out of this uh, pseudo tank control axis. You'll control normally in the air, so jumping around is a good way to reorient yourself or adjust your positioning without rotating the camera. You can also use the shoulder buttons to sidestep very slightly so you can adjust your position on smaller platforms before doing another jump. You can also press the circle button to flip around 180 degrees to face the opposite direction, which further makes it easier to aim your character without falling off the platform. All of these tools you have to carefully orient yourself make for a much more slowly paced platformer. It's a lot of careful jumping rather than acrobatic. Acrobatics. It's very simple, there's really not much to it. Karak's method of attacking is the classic tail whip. Man, I love me a good tail whip attack, and, uh, and a ground pound too, interestingly enough. That kind of makes me wonder if that was an idea carried on over from it being a Yoshi game originally. Because, you know, Yoshi is what invented the ground pound after all. At least to my knowledge, uh, Yoshi's Island, as far as I know, was the game that invented what we know today as the ground pound. But yeah, that's about it for the moveset. A simple but reliable attack, a move for breaking off, objects, a way to reorient yourself, and of course, a solid jump to, uh, you know, platform with. I found the jump pretty reliable, you know, it's accurate enough to do what you want it to do, and if you don't quite make the jump, there's always that ledge grab move that's got you covered. Again, the controls are very strange, and they will take getting used to, but once you got a hang of it, it's perfectly functional. Uh, I wish I could say the same about the swimming controls, though. It's, uh, it's similar to swimming in Mario 64, like, you know, you use the stick to aim and you mash a button to go forward, but here, the control is so slippery. Croc doesn't rotate responsively enough to give the player the proper feedback, so I always end up overshooting every rotation. Every time I land in some water, I end up zigzagging back and forth like an idiot just trying to get to the exit. Can you please just go, can you, no, no, come, no please, go, come on. Thank you. Luckily, there's no dedicated water levels. It's usually just a brief segment here and there. The levels are typically a series of small open rooms that are filled with platforms, bad guys, and occasionally a simple mechanism like a button or a switch. Your objective in every level is simply to get to the end and ring the gong, so you're really just trying to get to the end here. Getting there doesn't always entail that much. It's just your typical running and jumping and not falling in the pits. What I'm saying here is the level design is pretty basic, not a whole lot is going on here. In fact, they straight up recycled the exact same platform at least a hundred times. And I think this is when the game is at its weakest. There's only so many times I was going to take my time and land on all of these completely identical tiny platforms before I got kind of tired of it. Sometimes they do change it up, like having platforms that'll crumble and ones that'll rotate, but all that ever really does is decrease the amount of time you have to make that next jump, which isn't really all that big a change. Luckily, there's plenty of other obstacle types that give the game some much-needed variety from those same tiny platforms you'll see again and again. We've got monkey bars you can grab, trampolines to bounce on, and a whole slew of other stage gimmicks that, while nothing too special, are often enough to keep me entertained. There's collectibles in the game, we've got these little gem things, they pretty much serve the same purpose as rings in a Sonic game. If you get hit, you'll lose them all, and if you get hit with zero, you'll then lose a life. However many you have at the end of a stage will then be added up and after accumulating a hundred, you'll gain an extra life. There's also five unique gems of varying colors in every level as well. Getting all of these will unlock a bonus room at the end. These are found hidden in boxes and secret areas, or sometimes disguised as regular gems. Again, that kind of reminds me of Yoshi's Island, the red coins, how they would be disguised as regular coins sometimes. Perhaps another idea from when this was a Yoshi game? Who knows? The bonus room at the end of the stage contains one of the six gobos you're able to rescue 
in every level, so if you want to rescue them all, you'll also have to collect the five gems and do the bonus room as well as the main stage. The world map's really similar to the one from Donkey Kong Country, and even the one from the first Crash Bandicoot as well. The way it circles up an island, and then there's a unique island representing every world. That's kind of what we're dealing with here. And we've got four worlds total. There's a grass world, an ice world, a desert world, and lastly, the castle world where Baron Dante is. Each world has six levels and two bosses, one boss being halfway through the world and the second boss being at the end. It did get a little bit uh, samey feeling having every world use the exact same structure, but on the other hand, the level of consistency was kinda nice, I guess? Every boss in the game is some little critter that Baron Dante finds and transforms into a big creature. Okay, hold on a minute. Okay, th that's totally from Yoshi. Like, the other ones, maybe they could have been, but no, this one, this one has to be. This one's totally from when this used to be a Yoshi game. There's, there's no other way. Man, I love the cutscenes in this game, dude. They're so adorable. Like, man, they... They definitely got a number of chuckles out of me, that's for sure. The fights themselves, on the other hand, uh, I'd, I'd say it's probably the weakest part of this game. The boss fights just are not very well designed. The strategy is exactly the same every time, even on the final boss. You just wait for them to attack, you dodge, and you hit them when they're in their I'm dizzy because I missed animation, you know, they're all really easy but they're also very confusing. Sometimes fights would end when I was positive I never landed a single hit, and it's all because there is no feedback for doing damage to the boss. Every time I would beat a boss, it was like, oh, oh wait, what, I won? And it, it just smash cuts to white with the message. There's no victory animation or anything. They might have some really subtle blowback animation, I guess, but it blends so much into their other animations that it's almost impossible to recognize that you've done damage. And on top of that, it's almost impossible to even hit some of these bosses without being so close that you take damage yourself. What they needed was a sound effect, because there's no sound for hitting these bosses. And also some blink frames, maybe. Yeah, like that. There we go. See, that works. I didn't have a hard time finishing these fights. Like I said, they're all really easy, but the total lack of audiovisual communication for doing damage not only makes them very confusing, but also very unsatisfying. The actual levels are far better than the bosses, that's for sure. I mean, even the levels are pretty average when it comes to design, but there's good ideas here and there. My favorite was the inclusion of this enemy right here. These guys are called Ballistic Megs, and they'll zip across a platform in an instant leaving a trail of fire behind them. They all follow predetermined paths and always dash with the same timing, too. You'll have to time your jumps accordingly so you don't get smashed into or caught in the fire, but a lot of times these guys are going to be off screen, so in these cases you'll have to rely on your situational awareness. You'll have to listen to the sound cues and keep memorized how many dashes it'll be before they catch up to you. It's such a small and brilliant mechanic that has a player paying attention and planning accordingly. I really loved it. They were only ever used in a handful of of rooms though, I really wish they did more with these guys. Having even more challenging areas incorporating them, that would have been cool. Another level I thought was really fun was this one full of these mini games. It'll have you jumping on buttons to beat enemies, or this one that has you pushing this big balloon guy to a door and then using a bike pump to make him explode, blowing the door open. Croc's got some moments where it'll have a good and fun stage gimmick, but other times, I feel like the stage gimmicks are sometimes more hindering and annoying than they are challenging and entertaining. One of my biggest pet peeves were these dark rooms where you have to grab a lantern that'll light up the room for a short period of time, but if it runs out before you get to your destination, you're just dicked. You're gonna have to either waste a life and start over, or make some leaps of faith and pray for the best. Like the falling platforms from before, this is not really something that's changing how you play, but rather, just slapping a time limit on it. Overall, the level design is pretty hit and miss. Like, there's a handful of good and fun ideas in here, but otherwise, it's either gonna be just something mildly irritating, or or something that's just okay. You know, doesn't blow you away, but still kind of fun. I guess. One of my gripes with this game is how much of the level you don't even have to bother with if you don't care about getting all of the collectibles. There's so many rooms that have these big platforming sequences, and it's all just to get a collectible. Otherwise, you don't even have to bother with it. Well, at least you get an actually decent reward for getting them all. Uh, if you get all the gobos in the first three or in the last three levels of any world, you'll open up a bonus level that you can play to get a secret jigsaw piece. I mean, Banjo must have been behind them somewhere, right? There's two secret levels in every world 
world, making eight jigsaw pieces total. If you manage to get all eight of them, you unlock a hidden fifth world with a bunch of really challenging levels. These all reuse assets and stage gimmicks from previous levels, but of course with a ramped up difficulty. The last level of the bunch, I actually had to use a code to skip it because I could not beat the damn thing. There's this jump at the very beginning of this level that's so impossibly hard to make. This little dickhead standing here shoots a fireball at you the second you try to make the jump, and since there's no gems at the beginning of this level, it's a one-hit kill no matter what. It is almost impossible to get by this guy. In fact, I only managed to do it once, and since I had no lives because of this jerk, I got a game over before I could get to the end. After trying again and again and again, I was done. I was at it for like an hour before I gave up, so I decided to use a level skip code to skip this one level. Like, whatever, I beat the rest of the game legitimately, right? So, what's the harm in doing this? The final secret level is a hidden boss fight, and it's honestly kind of pathetic. They tried to make it a bit different than the other boss fights by having you land on these platforms in a circle and whacking all these gongs instead of attacking the boss directly, but I was doing it for like three solid minutes and there was no sign of the fight coming to a close, so I started to wonder if I was doing something wrong. But like, no, I looked up a walkthrough and that's actually what you do. I guess it just takes that long? On my second attempt, I figured out that you don't even have to use the platforms in the middle. You can just land on the edge and then jump across from there. It makes dodging the projectiles so much easier and you can hit the gongs way faster too. And within 50 seconds, he was dead? Wait, wait, what was different this time? Did I have to hit them faster than before? I don't know. The boss fights in this game, man, you you gotta keep the player informed somehow. Come on, guys. But if I gotta give credit where credit is absolutely due, it is in the presentation. This game might be pretty average, but it is just so lovable. The character designs, the animations, even the huge variety in enemy types. There are so many types of enemies in this game. The graphics overall are pretty good. Everything is vibrant, popping out with bright and wonderful choices of color, but of course, if there's one thing we gotta talk about, it's that soundtrack. There are so many songs to this thing, and they're pretty dang good too. If there's one thing that I felt kept chugging me along, it was those jamming tunes. And uh, yeah, that's Croc. It's a pretty average game with a handful of cool and fun ideas, a handful of really annoying ideas, and really weird controls. But you know, it's still cute and quirky and fun in its own right, so I can easily see somebody having very fond memories growing up with this game. There are glimmers of something truly special here, but the game just ends up being just like, okay, and not much more. But even still, the magical thing about a game that's just okay and not much more is that you still have the opportunity to take it and make it something truly special. You know, aka make a sequel, which is exactly what they did. Croc 2, baby, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at next time. Uh, yeah, hopefully it just uh, addresses some of the issues and flaws I have with the first game and adds even more new and fun stuff. Uh, will it actually do that? I don't know. We'll find out next time when we take a look at Croc 2. See you guys then. Uh, hello, welcome to the end slate. Uh, if you want to check out another platforming game I've done before, you can click the link right here. And if you maybe want to support the show and help me continue doing it as a full-time job, you can donate as little as a dollar a month to my Patreon and get access to the Nitrad podcast and some blooper reels and stuff. So, uh, yeah, love you guys and see you again soon.